The late 90s were a time of great cultural change. It was the age of Mountain Dew and Nu Metal, Jerry Springer and South Park. It was a time when society, for the most part, got together and agreed to take all these high-minded moral values and throw them in the trash. It was time to revel in the filth of human existence. And somehow, of all places, this massive cultural shift that was going on seemed to concentrate and in some ways was inspired by the greatest sport on earth, professional wrestling. But not everyone was happy about the direction American culture was headed in. So for this video, let's talk about the World Wrestling Federation versus the Parents Television Council. This video is brought to you by Lockhards in collaboration with Jinx. I've had a lot of people ask me about products that I use in my hair, and I actually have my own product now. And now my band Jinx in collaboration with Lockhards has created the Devil Volumizing Cream. It's good for any length of hair, I like to put it in mine when it's still just a little bit damp after washing it. And you wind up with a little bit extra volume and a nice scent with notes of pink pepper, saffron, bergamot, antique oak wood and smoke. Just go to the link in the description and use code WANG for 15% off. We gotta save the children from the evils of pro wrestling. I mean, if I think about it, when I was growing up, pretty much all the trouble that I ever got in had to do with wrestling. Walking around like bushwhackers. Locking my teacher out of the classroom so I could elbow drop another kid. My teacher getting scared to make me go to the principal's office because I said my mother's boyfriend is the hitman. She was a big fan of Brett the Hitman Hart, but the teacher thought I meant an actual mafia hitman. Well, you know, kids do dumb things, and at that point in time, it was more just individual parents getting annoyed by shit their kids are getting into because of wrestling, and not so much an organized movement to completely deplatform wrestling. But that would all change when the Parents Television Council came around. But to properly tell the story of WWF and the Parents Television Council, we must first take a look at the beginnings of the Attitude Era. In particular, the feud between Bret Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin, where the whole thing really began. So in late 1995, Steve Austin comes into the WWF as the ringmaster. He's a part of Ted DiBiase's stable, the Million Dollar Corporation, who really had their best days behind them. And it puts Steve Austin, one of the greatest talkers in the history of wrestling, in the role of having Ted DiBiase as his manager, who is also one of the best talkers in the history of wrestling, but it keeps Steve Austin from fully being Steve Austin. Throughout 1996, Steve Austin finds himself embroiled in a feud with Savio Vega, who was robbed of his rightful victory over Mabel that prior year at King of the Ring 1995, forever cursing the future trajectory of the World Wrestling Federation and pro wrestling as a whole. In May of that year, the feud culminates in a Caribbean strap match between Steve Austin and Savio Vega at a pay-per-view In Your House Beware of Dog 2. This match has the stipulation that if Steve Austin loses, Ted DiBiase must leave the WWF forever. So, Steve Austin loses on purpose. Not only does this move free up Austin to speak for himself and fully be Steve Austin, it also sets him up to be a new kind of heel. You see, growing up it always seemed like there was sort of a camaraderie among the villains. The good guy wrestlers were friends with the good guy wrestlers, and the bad guy wrestlers were friends with the bad guy wrestlers. But Steve Austin had no friends. He was purely in it for himself, to hell with anybody else's alignment. He was a guy who would just as soon betray an ally as he would help out an enemy as long as it all served his ultimate goals. The last time I could remember seeing anything like that was Bad News Brown, who in a lot of ways was Stone Cold 10 years before Stone Cold was Stone Cold, and who coincidentally also had one of his most memorable moments with Bret Hart, this time at WrestleMania 4. During a battle royal at WrestleMania 4, Bad News Brown and Bret Hart form a temporary alliance and act like they're gonna share the prize. But Bad News Brown, of course, double-crosses Bret Hart, causing Bret Hart to have a big tantrum and destroy his trophy. Bad News Brown and Stone Cold Steve Austin were very similar guys, but this time it was different. Because you see, when I was a kid who liked Bad News Brown, that was weird. I was a weirdo for liking Bad News Brown. 
But when I was a teenager who thought Stone Cold Steve Austin was a fucking badass, everybody else was on board with me. I remember it so vividly being in school during Stone Cold Steve Austin's rise and all the kids talking about who their favorite wrestler was. It seemed like almost every single one said their favorite was Steve Austin, but at the same time, everyone seemed kind of surprised that everyone else said Steve Austin because it kind of felt like it was a thing that we weren't supposed to be doing. Stone Cold was the bad guy, and you're not supposed to cheer for the bad guy. And you contrast that to his nemesis, Bret Hart, who was the squeaky clean, family-friendly face of the WWF throughout the early 90s. During the rise of Stone Cold, Bret Hart is on a hiatus, and eventually Stone Cold starts calling out Bret Hart over and over again, and finally, he comes back, and he's just as popular as he ever was. But still, it's clear that during this time, Bret Hart is returning to a WWF in which the landscape has changed dramatically. Bret is still super popular, but at the same time, they're fighting, and just as many people are cheering for Stone Cold, who at this point is still officially the heel in this rivalry. And although Bret repeatedly beats Stone Cold in the ring, Steve Austin seems like he's constantly winning the battle of which guy is cooler, which in pro wrestling really is the whole game. And this all culminates in what I believe to be one of the most pivotal moments, not just in the careers of Bret Hart and Steve Austin, not just in the history of pro wrestling, but really in the history of American culture as a whole. A no disqualification submission match at WrestleMania 13 with the special guest referee, the world's most dangerous man, Ken Shamrock. And at the end of a grueling 22 minute bout, Bret applies the sharpshooter to Stone Cold. Stone Cold, low on energy and with blood dripping down his face all over the mat, struggles to break the sharpshooter. He has a brief glimmer of hope, but ultimately he just cannot escape the move. But he refuses to submit and holds on as long as he can before ultimately he passes out unconscious. Despite Steve Austin not having actually given up, Ken Shamrock has no other choice but to award the match to Bret Hart. And then it happens. In a completely uncharacteristic move, Bret starts to beat down his unconscious opponent. He's awarded a chorus of boos from the crowd in attendance until Ken Shamrock stops him. Finally, after the beatdown, Stone Cold awakens to a standing ovation from the audience. And just to be sure that Austin isn't suddenly Mr. Nice Guy, he turns around and gives a Stone Cold Slutter to the referee who was just trying to help him out. He limps back to the locker room as the crowd chants his name, and in that moment, everything has changed. To me, this moment encapsulated everything that was going on in American culture at the time. That whole goody two-shoes routine, fuck that, we don't want that anymore, it's bullshit, it doesn't speak to us. And thus, we go from the era of nice guys doing nice guy things to the era of Val Venus getting his wiener chopped off. Big boss man tricking Al Snow into eating his own dog. The era of puppies and Triple H fucking a corpse. And while decrying the fall into degeneracy of both the WWF and American culture as a whole became part of Bret Hart's character, it was also the larger cultural conversation that was going on in the real world. And as pro wrestling's ratings exploded during this time, so did society's criticisms of it. Take for example Phil Mushnick of the New York Post. Throughout the 90s, even prior to the Attitude Era, Phil Mushnick published several articles critical of the WWF. Often, these articles focused on the WWF's questionable labor practices, which is absolutely something worth looking into. But as the Attitude Era went on, Phil got more and more into simply pearl-clutching over content, criticizing the fans themselves, in fact, coining the term Degeneration X when referring to the kinds of people who might watch wrestling. And what would really bring this conflict to a fever pitch would be when Jim Cornette famously went on Monday Night Raw to directly address Phil Mushnick. It was in response to a particularly inflammatory article following the death of Brian Pillman. This promo basically made Phil Mushnick public enemy number one of wrestling fans worldwide. But at the end of the day, even though he was a total fucking wiener, Phil Mushnick was just a guy with a platform and an opinion. And although he did at times criticize companies for daring to work with WWF, 
He was not engaged in a full-fledged attempt to completely deplatform them. Enter the Parents Television Council. The Parents Television Council, as you might assume from the name, is the ultimate won't so and please think about the children organization. Founded in 1995 by conservative activist L. Brent Bozell III, its stated mission was to restore responsibility to the entertainment industry. How would they go about restoring responsibility to the entertainment industry? By petitioning the FCC to issue fines and censor things, and by engaging in letter-writing campaigns against companies' advertisers. Just legions and legions of soccer moms threatening boycotts. They justified their existence by pointing to an increase in sex, violence, and bad words on TV, and they actually would sit and count the amount of bad words on certain shows, and they were probably correct in saying that these things were increasing, but... okay? Like, who cares? Not everything needs to be for your kids. And through all this, they maintained that they were perfectly fine with adults being able to watch mature programming. It was just that they wanted to make sure that children's programming was safe. So they started off by targeting such children's programs as Married with Children, Spin City, and CSI. But they weren't all negative, they did have a Best Of Award, they award to 7th Heaven basically every year. So the Parents Television Council is getting their bearings while WWF is transitioning into the Attitude Era, basically growing up with their audience. Although at this point, the children of Hulkamania were mostly either teenagers or even in their early 20s, the Parents Television Council maintained that this was programming aimed at children. And thus began perhaps their biggest censorship campaign to date. It begins in mid-1999 with the debut of WWF Smackdown. This show in particular draws the attention of the Parents Television Council because unlike Raw, which is on cable, this show is on network TV, which has stricter rules. And thus their letter writing campaign against all of their sponsors begins, and it's actually effective at first. Coca-Cola drops, Domino's Pizza drops, AT&T drops, and finally, WWF says, okay guys, I guess we're gonna tone down SmackDown a little bit. Having to bend the knee to these kinds of people probably killed Vince McMahon on the inside just a little bit. See, Vince McMahon is not an ordinary CEO. Vince McMahon is the type of guy who at 70 years old decided that he was going to write himself out of the story to get hip surgery in real life by taking an F5 from Brock Lesnar. He's the type of guy who got himself into a lifting contest with world's strongest man Mark Henry and truly believed that he would win. He's the type of guy who gets mad at himself for sneezing because he thinks getting a cold is a sign of weakness. Imagine a guy like that being made to kiss the ring of some nerd who looks like Dr. Zayas. You know Vince McMahon was not just gonna bow down so easily. At first, Vince McMahon just responds to the PTC with a letter. Thanks for getting on our ass. Now I'm gonna get on yours. He goes on in the letter to tell them that they're anti-American and they just need to lighten up a little bit. I imagine that whoever it was at the PTC that read this, they kind of looked at it, chuckled, and threw it in the fucking garbage. Content in believing that they've won the battle. Little did they know, incurring the wrath of Vince McMahon would be a very, very costly mistake. But for now, things would just be a little bit silly. WWF introduces a stable with the purpose of parodying the PTC called the RTC, or the Right to Censor. They would often go on PTC like tirades about the offensive content in WWF, try to cover up women's skimpy outfits, or remove weapons from hardcore matches. And it's important to note that throughout this whole time, we're in the middle of an election year. We got George W. Bush versus Al Gore. And at the time, WWF is running a campaign to reach out to the youth and try to get them to vote. It's called Smack Down the Vote. And this leads to a situation where The Rock is at the Republican National Convention, and you know who else is there? One L. Brent Bozell III of the Parents Television Council. Here's what The Rock had to say about that. We don't portray murder. We don't portray uh, rape or robbery or anything like that. And we're certainly tame compared to what you can see on other network uh, television shows and other cable television shows. As far as for Mr. Bozell's comments, uh, you know, regarding uh, 
uh, th that someone in the Republican Party must be on drugs for inviting The Rock. Well, if, if freedom of expression is a drug, then I su certainly suggest Mr. Bozell should try a little bit of it. And wouldn't you know it, The Rock's appearance at the Republican National Convention would also draw the ire of Phil Mushnick. While the Republican Party ostensibly stands for good old-fashioned family values, its special guests during its presidential convention were none other than the leading action figures of the World Wrestling Federation, an organization practiced at wearing its sweet, civic-minded mask when needed, but that's long been in the business of popularizing degenerate acts. That the Republican Party was able to escape widespread and lasting ridicule for embracing the WWF during a presidential convention is evidence of a news media that is either sorrowfully blind to the WWF's content, or, in the case of television news, co-opted by their network's investments in pro wrestling. Two Mondays ago, as the Republican National Convention began in Philly, Vince McMahon's WWF staged a nationally televised show in Atlanta. It featured its usual pornographic, hateful, and violent performances that have made it so attractive to children, young adults, and now, three months before a presidential election, to the Republican Party. At one point, a group of barely clothed, large-breasted WWF women paraded outside the George Dome in a mock demonstration. They encouraged onlookers to chant, Save the Hoes. Hose is street for whores. Little boys now reflexively refer to little girls as bitches and hoes in large part thanks to McMahon and his national TV enablers, which now, incredibly, include NBC and CBS. Thank you for the explanation of street lingo, Mr. Mushnick. It's also worth noting that Al Gore's running mate during this election was one Joe Lieberman who you might remember from the early 90s war against Mortal Kombat and violent video games, and who, surprise surprise, was a member of the Parents Television Council. So despite the SmackDown The Vote initiative being a non-partisan effort, the WWF couldn't help but take a few jabs at Joe Lieberman. In particular, Jerry Lawler saying during a match on commentary that Lieberman would be at home right up there censoring things with the right to censor. This was a moment that some inside the Democratic Party thought might have actually helped George W. Bush secure the election. And although that might sound silly on its face, considering how close that election was, how influential wrestling was at the time, and how attacked wrestling fans felt by the forces of censorship around them, it's very possible there is something to that. But I always knew that Joseph Lieberman was up to no good ever since that day I saw his face in Game Pro Magazine. Either way, we were in the thick of one of history's most contentious presidential elections, and it was around that moment that the Parents Television Council would make their fatal error. Allow me to take you back to the case of Lionel Tate and Tiffany Eunuch. You might not remember their names, but you probably remember the headlines. A 13-year-old boy accidentally kills a little girl that he was babysitting by imitating wrestling moves that he saw on TV. This was big news at the time, and it fit perfectly into the Parents' Television Council's narrative. And you better believe that they were quick to capitalize on this, putting this in their letters to advertisers. One such correspondence was published on their website when they were trying to get MCI WorldCom to pull from WWE. Bear in mind, our outrage over WWF SmackDown is fueled by the fact that 3 million children weekly are treated to heavy doses of violence, racial stereotyping, foul language, graphic sexual innuendo, and sexist comments. Moreover, a portion of SmackDown airs during the traditional family hour, a time when impressionable children are most likely to be watching television. Are these MCI's values? And if you're confused by the term family viewing hour, allow me to explain. Family viewing hour is a period of time, the first hour of prime time, in which only family-oriented content is allowed to be broadcast. This only ever actually existed in any kind of official capacity from 1975 to 1977. It ended in 1977 because it was deemed unconstitutional. And despite the Parents Television Council campaigning to bring back family viewing hour, it has never existed since. In essence, appealing to a company to recognize family viewing hour 
is like trying to get a company to close for Festivus. It's not a real thing. The correspondence goes on. Wrestling shows are having a deadly impact on our children. Four children have been killed by peers who were emulating wrestling moves they learned by watching programs such as WWF Smackdown. Four children aged 14 months to 6 years old had their lives cut tragically short because of the effect wrestling had on their peers. Police reports, attorneys for the defendants, autopsy reports, and victims' families point the finger of blame at the wrestling industry that purposely targets children as an audience. And that right there is where they fucked up big time. Let's take a look at the autopsy report. Six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch did not die as a result of children's horseplay, but likely from a brutal, sustained beating, according to the Broward County Medical Examiner. If you remember this story when I brought it up before, you probably went your whole life thinking that this little girl really did die because of a wrestling move. Because, you know, the truth just isn't as catchy of a headline. But according to the autopsy, this was something far worse. A deliberate, brutal beating by a troubled kid. This was absolutely, in no way, something that could have happened by accident because of a wrestling move. Yet, either due to ignorance or a callous disregard for the truth, the PTC persisted. L. Brent Bozell went on to publish an article entitled, Brent Bozell to WWF, You're on your back and the count is two. I guess the WWFE has learned the hard way just how painful it is to be smacked down by responsible corporate advertisers. As the chairman of the PTC, I claim full responsibility for an educational campaign that tells the truth about SmackDown's raw, sexual content and violent programming that is marketed directly to the children of our nation. Vince and Linda McMahon can malign the PTC and me personally all they want. They can make all the legal threats against our organization they wish, and their supporters can continue their death threats against us. But the PTC will continue its campaign to convince corporate America that it has a national responsibility to turn away from such violent and sexually explicit programming aimed at children. He went on to list 37 advertisers who as a result of their efforts removed their advertisements from WWF programming. Some of these advertisers included Slim Jim, Chef Boy RD, the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard, all of which WWF had worked with closely. Well, at this point, we were well behind simple mockery and angry letters sent by Vince McMahon. On November 9th, two days after the election came and went, and the entire country was entrenched in a debate about recounts and what the hell a hanging chat is. WWF filed a lawsuit against L. Brent Bozell III and the Parrots Television Council, which in the document is referred to as an extremist organization. The suit charges them with tortious interference, product disparagement, copyright infringement, libel, among other things. It claims that the list of advertisers that supposedly withdrew from WWF SmackDown was falsified. Not only that, the list of advertisers was published without any of these companies being made aware. It also alleges that both advertisers and retailers were lied to and threatened that they would be labeled by the Parents Television Council as not family friendly. It also stated that the Parents Television Council was actually registered as a fictional entity owned by the Media Research Center and they were running a donation matching scam that was defrauding their donors. And to hammer home the nature of the Parent Television Council's griff, they pointed to the Parent Television Council's marketplace, an affiliate marketing thing that they had set up where they would receive a percent of purchases. Some of these stores included Toys R Us, which sold WWF toys, and a greeting card company that sold sexual greeting cards, like any kind of sexual thing you could think of, it was on a greeting card. You could buy a gay, straight, masturbation, orgasm, greeting cards, and each purchase would put some money in the coffers of the Parent Television Council. And perhaps the most important part of this lawsuit, it pointed out that in the Tiffany Una case, the idea that her death was caused by a wrestling move was completely rejected by the court itself. 
The Parents Television Council responded by filing a motion to dismiss the lawsuit citing the First Amendment, to which the judge responded, the First Amendment does not protect statements that are false and defamatory even if they are made in the context of a public debate about issues of general concern. A court date was set, but ultimately this case would reach a settlement in July of 2002. The agreement reached was that the Parents Television Council had paid the WWF $3.5 million. In addition, and probably what was even more satisfying to Vince McMahon, Brent Bozell agreed to meet personally with the advertisers who were lied to, and he would write a personal letter of apology to the WWF. I can only imagine that Vince sat there and just came over and over again reading this letter. To this day, he probably has it saved somewhere special. But all that being said, although justice was served and this was a costly mistake for the Parents Television Council, in the grand scheme of things, not much would be changed. Ultimately, the WWF, now the WWE, would clean up its act of its own volition, ushering in the PG era. Although they've kind of pulled back on that a little bit more recently. I mean, I guess you gotta spice things up with AEW in the picture now. And good old Phil Mushnick is still up to his old tricks. Although he has, in the time since, expressed regret for directly insulting wrestling fans, he still does things like go after HBO for daring to air a documentary about Andre the Giant. And as for the Parents Television Council, believe it or not, they're actually still around. These days, they're more focused on streaming services. Did you know that each episode of The Witcher contains a hundred instances of adult content? You mean The Witcher that has a game where you win cards for fucking? I never would have guessed. Truly a valuable service being provided here. But anyway, that's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about the old rumor that there were actually two Ultimate Warriors. I'm out of here.